Uh, thank you very much for coming on the podcast today, Dougie. How are we? Oh, um, ticket to boo, Christian. Mm. Uh, if I'm being honest, uh, thanks very much for uh, inviting us on. Uh, I think it's about time the lads had a platform where they could come on, give their views, or put questions to like so somebody yourself, whatever. Uh, and get it out there. Uh, we seem to be a special industry. It uh, doesn't matter what we do. There's been, there's, it's an industry like most with peaks and troughs and that, you know what I mean? But now, I think we're finding ourselves uh, we're being underpaid. I don't think in real money terms, we've had the real pay rise in 15 years uh, because nine times out of 10, we don't even get inflation pay rises. Uh, and to round that off, they either put a national insurance up or they squeeze the tax so the middle learners, and that's what what we basically are, we are middle learners, not because we earn a high rate of pay, but because we work longer hours than most people, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's sort of working weekends and working 7-12s and, and whatever else. But yeah, the whole idea of this uh, podcast is to, obviously, is to try and help shine a light on the industry, but it's also to talk about the things that need talking about. And I'm glad to have you on, very outspoken on LinkedIn, um, which is a good thing because everybody deserves to be heard. Yeah, well, this I came up with this idea uh, just if, during lockdown. When uh, things started opening up again and people were starting recruiting men, the rates, for whatever reason, took a... Uh, Severe nosedive. Uh, and I remember saying, right, that's it. I'm going to put these rates up. So I started putting some of the jobs up on LinkedIn. Uh, it was like a wall of shame. Uh, I was seeing ridiculous rates for uh, welders, players, £11.5, £12 an hour. Uh, some companies, even during lockdown, lockdown had... Uh, we're actually forcing them in to take pay cuts or reduce their rate just to boost the profit margin. Uh, this used to be industry opportunity, but that opportunity doesn't know for everybody anymore. Christian, uh, you'll know yourself. There's a lot of guys coming into the industry. Uh, they're sort of putting the uh, the cart before the horse. They're coming in with low skill bases. Even yourself being a welder, respecting that. There's a lot of guys coming into the inspection game who are ex-military. I don't have a problem with these guys coming in. When they've done so much time, they get awarded so much money for retraining and that, which, to be honest, it is a good thing. But Companies are using these guys to force the wages down. It's clearly evident there. Uh, they're being taken on. The companies are getting sponsorship money. I think there's a some sort of funding set up where if they take on X-Forces guys uh, for an inspection, safety, whatever, they're awarded a monetary amount. I don't know how much it is, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine it's a couple of pounds. But as I say, I don't have a problem with anybody coming into the industry. But at least give your time. Give, give yourself a bit of time to learn a trade or a skill and then come into the industry. But don't expect to come in high above the guys that served a four-year apprenticeship, went to college, paid for a lot of courses themselves. Because this, this money isn't available for everybody. You know what I mean? It isn't a 
a fair market. There's a lot of discrimination coming into the industry now, especially with people my age, uh, over 55, where companies are reluctant to hire people. So we have been forced to the in industry because of our age. It doesn't matter about your experience. The way they're looking at it is, well, we'd rather have a young guy because these old guys are set in their ways. Well, that's not really true because as old guys have been in the industry a long time. We've, we've done the good jobs and we've done the bad jobs. We've seen good times and we've seen bad times. However, it doesn't mean to say you have to discriminate against us. I mean, there was an advert one LinkedIn the other week, and it, it was for a major company uh, that owned a lot of lifting barges. And one of the criteria on the advert was you had to be for, under 45 years of age. That's disgraceful. How is that That's, even possible? It's probably because they're registered in a different country. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But you wouldn't get away with it here. Even, I've seen guys commentating on, uh, commenting on it who had worked under in the offshore section. They'd been engineers or uh, offshore construction managers and stuff. Uh, but the game's changing. The game, but we seem to be stuck back in the 1980s. Uh, you know yourself. Just uh, mention. Years ago, the only real national agreement that we've really got for onshore was the Nighty Agreement. Now, the Nighty Agreement has suffered years and after year after year. Uh, declining standards. Shutdowns are getting smaller. A lot of men relied on the shutdowns, especially the coal-fired ones, where they could make big bonuses and that. But these are virtually gone now. So what you're finding is shutdowns are squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. But when you look at Nike, the, the money hasn't moved. It's just not moved for years. It's still a bit £1,250 a week, £1,300 a week, and that's inclusive of your dig money, which only goes up uh, only goes up with a rate of pay. So if you get 2%, your dig money goes up 2%. And 2% of £300 isn't a lot of money, you know what I mean? It's, what, six quid a week or something? It's preposterous. And then we used to, I used to sit on the uh, OCPA, I think I sat on it for about six years out of ten in my time offshore. Now, that was a wee bit different uh, tonight. For the simple reason was it was a minimal standard agreement. So, companies could pay you a minimum, right? But they could also pay you 40, 50, 60 pound a day mayor as much as they wanted. But when the oil crash came, they all, the employing companies basically sold their soul to the devil, i.e. Uh, the oil companies. They increased two and two uh, rotors to three and three, which I was outspoken about. I think I was on record as saying, well, I'm not, I'm not doing three and three. Uh, the offshore industry as well, is very notorious for boys. Well, boys being standing up and say, pointing out uh, safety matters and that. You, when you go on these platforms, you're battered with safety. You have a safety meeting every Sunday night. They tell you if something's not right, report it. I've seen guys who went up and reported good, incid uh, good incidents, raised safety awareness. It's been 
a paper exercise. And some of these guys have been removed from platforms or paid off when they're on their leave when they finish their trip and never seen again. Now, I'm not saying this is a fault of the safety men or HSEs, but I've seen HSEs being basically told well, the inspectors they come here, basically told, look, you're self-employed here. You watch what you're doing. Now, we could get rid of you tomorrow and replace you. And these are true facts. These are some of the horror stories that these people went up with. Now, if I like to see yourself being a welding inspector, you can't you can't cheat in graphs. You can't make a well pass if it's failed. Same, so why should you bother? And why, I think a lot of these HSE guys join it, go and do their qualifications in that for the right reasons. So they then offer the position and they're self-employed. So they become self-employed. But these guys also run the risk of never working in the sector again if they if they don't play by their rules. It's it's a dog eat dog world out there. Uh, then we've we'll got shipyards, which at a minute and over the coming months we've got you've got tight twenty six frigates getting built. BAE Systems in Glasgow. You've got the Type 31s getting built at Babcock and Rosyth. You've got a new breed uh, submarine getting built in Barrow and Furness. You've got a repair work, uh, you've got a repair work in Plymouth, Portsmouth. And you've also got your RFA contract that's going into Holland and Wolf. Now, again, these all sound good with inflated rates, but they're forcing people to go umbrella companies. Some of them will allow CIS, which is probably better for the boys. But this umbrella scheme, they're never going to attract the amount of people they want. They keep on talking about training, but it takes you time as you train apprentices. And the chances are, a lot of these boys, when they do get qualified, if they train them up the NVQ level three or that, are going to disappear anyway in search of pasture new. Once they've completed these NVQs or apprenticeships and that, so they just, shipyards have always been low paid. They've never really moved on. But, a lot of the industries fed off uh, the shipyards for years, especially the oil fabrication. I started off in 1983 in Scott Lithgow's uh, in Greenock and Port Glasgow. And uh, they built about two or three platforms. They'd done the ILA, they'd done the Sea Explorer and the Ocean Alliance. Well, I basically served my whole apprenticeship on the Ocean Alliance. When we shot in 19, I think it was November 87, when the rig was going down to Taylor Bank and then out for trials and that, they just scattered thousands of people. So companies like Barrow and Furness, the old British shipbuilders, they took hundreds and hundreds of men from my area and they took them down. And a lot of guys have done well with it. They've moved to Barra. And they've just worked away in the shipyards all their life. So it's been good for some, but it was never good for everybody. And then the guys started doing the circuits. We all became from fully paid up employees. We basically became subcontractors. And we, we worked the jobs. We went to Nig Bay. We worked to Ardisia, uh, places like that. You know what I mean? And then 
we branched out, we got on to the blue book jobs and all this, you know, but I just think my honest opinion is we've stood still for too long. Uh, I don't see anybody coming through anymore. It's going to radically change stuff overnight. Uh, people are being squeezed all the time. I don't know. Do you remember about 10 years ago when uh, they called it the Besna? It was B-E-S-N-A. Besna was basically companies were trying to de-skill the electrical trade. And the electricians work, especially uh, on site and that. The industrial mm -hmm. electricians, I'm not talking about the guys that do the houses and that. So what they were trying to do was remove the steel work, the tray work, the uni strut away from the sparks, and then train labourers up to fit up, which means the sparks would then only be brought on a job and they would lose roughly between 75 and 8% of the workload. I think I remember this, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of boys, especially a London branch, uh, they stood up there and they formed a ramp, rank and file group. And they took these companies on. They stopped jobs in London. They, they turned up at sites and they actually beat them on this. But they did come back and try something else. And I think that was pushed in again. But apart from these guys, the rank and file boys, I'm just not seeing the young people or even the older ones that are willing to stand up with a plate anymore and be counted. Now, As you said, the issue is probably a lot of people are through the agency now, or, and you know that they can basically give you a notice and a week later you're gone. So that's probably a big issue. See, when you become, when you go into a job and you're self-employed, whether it be CIS, inside IR or outside IR 35, does the matter. You're a one-man band. You, your own limited company. So you're working for yourself. So for whatever reason, they can remove you any time they want. You know what I mean? So then you've got no harmony on the job. And we're also seeing... I lack a union membership, I think it's uh, probably a bit money old time lows. A lot of people will find that uh, hard to believe. We all the recent strikes for the dawn and uh, with the railways, the uh, public sector, the nurses, the doctors, stuff like that. But in our industry, I think we're doing to some like six point six million people in a union, which is at an old time low. And the last time I sat on the OCA was about three years ago. Uh, and I remember saying to the full time official, who was a good friend, really. He's actually from the same place as me. And mm. uh, I said to him, see if you just don't get your finger out. I said, yous are not going to exist in 20 years' time. People are not willing to join the union anymore, Christian. For whatever reason or different reasons, that's true. I mean, I was a member in GMB for 38 years. And on the last night you pay award, I think it was 2.5%. I was working with a, a company who'd signed up with a full night year agreement on working various power stations up and down the country. I actually phoned the full-time official and at the time, and I said, what is this pay rise? And they went, well, the men accepted it. And I said, what do you mean the men accepted it? I said, I'm working for blah, blah, blah. I said, and they've got over 100 full-time employees, pipe fitters, riggers, welders, 
players and that. I said, and nobody, but nobody got a vote on this pay deal. I said, you are driving people away from the union. And if you've got no union, who's going to fight for you? Nobody's got... You need to get back a long time ago. Employers will try and make as much money as they can for themselves. Now, anything that we've got, anything we've won or anything we've lost is because the men stuck together. They got unions involved and the unions fought for the men. If you're in a dispute today, you try to get a hold of a full-time official and get me to come down to your site. It's, it's near impossible sometimes. It's like everything else. There's good union officials and there's bad union officials. There's good companies out there who toe the line, right? Who yep. pay everything. Now, when you're on a blue book job, you know what you're getting, right? We don't always agree with it. I think the bonus needs to be looked at. I think the boys need a massive pay rise in the region of 20, 25%. They need that bonus taken off the table, off the pay uh, scale, because any money that can be withdrawn from the worker isn't the real money. So let's get the cards on the table, get the unions mandated, get people back in the union and get this bonus off and get the money up and fight for it and modernise the industry and start modernise it by getting the men a decent pay rise that they deserve. Because if you don't, a lot of companies knew, as we addressed earlier, a lot of these companies knew they'll do anything to cut costs. Some of them are even put outsource recruitment. Yeah, maybe an employment agency. Now, these people are probably only getting paid for every body they get on the job. But it's there's a bone of contention with a lot of people agencies. Uh, how much money they're making. And I, I've never really bothered about how much money they were making. See, as long as they paid me what I was entitled to or what I thought I deserve, I never really had a problem with that. But there's a lot of boys out there who feel strong that they won't work for these employment agencies. And it's their choice at the end of the day, and I can understand that. But same as the agreements and the same as the agreements and the, the conditions we're working in, a lot of these people are still living 20, 30 years, 40 years ago. You know what I mean? Where it's just higher than fire. I mean, casualization the industry has forced a lot of people with it, especially offshore industry. I know guys that, that worked offshore for years and years and years. And, and the companies kept them on because they were good. So when they finished their job, they went home, done their leave, maybe a week, two weeks later, blah, 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 phone call. Can you go to... Heather's say, I know, brother, blah, 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 and off they went, and the thing they continued. But that's all stopped now since a lot of that stopped now since uh, yeah, since uh, the last oil crash. And a lot of these boys now, they're getting one trip, they're down manned, they don't know where their next trip will be, or they're getting a phone call, will you go here? They're turning up with Aberdeen and the job isn't the air anymore, the job has been cancelled. So they're left out of pocket or whatever, especially self-employed guys. They might have laid out for hotels and that. When are we going to say, we're not having this anymore? I mean, people use the term enough is enough, but that's just becoming a running mill saying now. It's all right saying it, and arguing on the tea shacks and the works canteens. Oh, we should be doing this, we should be doing that. 
But if nobody takes the lead on that, nothing's ever going to get done. You know what I'm saying? The industry mm. needs leaders. But to be a leader, you need to be prepared for the, the pitfalls that come with it. In a lot of cases, they're going to go for you. They're going to blacklist you. You've got to try and be squeaky clean, right? Because if you know, they'll pin someone on you and they'll just do anything to get you. I mean, I've never been one. I've took a hit. I've took a hit many a time. And I'm, I've been kind of glad I took a hit. But sometimes you just know my time's up on this job and you just move on. But other times I've dug my heels and said, no. I mean, we've probably all been paid off, out of turn, paid off unfairly uh, in my time. I mean, I've been in the industry, what, nearly 40 years now, uh, 36 years, this year, since I came out of my time. And I've never seen nothing like it. Uh, companies, some people just believe in and the companies tell them, oh, we're crushed for us. And, well, it's like a government telling you, oh, inflation, 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 inflation. That's just deflecting. Them talking about inflation is just deflecting money away from vital services so they can reuse that money on marine morality projects to make their cell look good and make their sell money. It's, we're becoming a very, very corrupt country. I, th I think we're probably a laughing stock of Europe now. What's the day is go on social media and moan, moan, moan. I've just found out about an hour ago here. The French are having a one-day national strike on the 7th of March. Uh, because they're raising their pension age from 62 to 64. The Tories are up in their retirement age to 68, and everybody's just taking it as if, oh, that's the way it is. They also get the lowest pensions in Europe. It's an absolute disgrace. Highest energy bills as well at the moment. Sort of the price of energy is incredible, and then... Sort of these corporations are posting billions and billions of pounds worth of profit. It's corporate greed. That's all it is. And it's been aided and abetted uh, by the government. Now, the boys that work in the, the power stations, guys that work offshore and stuff like that, the wind farms, I mean, these guys have not been rewarded, uh, not just for their work effort, but for the sacrifices they're making, you ain't getting that time back. If you are away from your family for three and a half weeks and then you get a long week at end off, and then you're back to work again, what quality of life have you got? The thing is, you're not just working 12 hours because you're away for 24 hours, so it's, it's a long time, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, some guys are doing three weeks offshore. 12 hours a day, blah, blah, blah. And they get used to it. You, you, you sort of become institutionalised. Then you've got the guys that do the wind turbines offshore, the GWO guys. I mean, the industry they're in is so casual. I mean, I, I was reading the boys' post the other day, and it's it sent like in the last couple of months since Christmas, so many hundred CVs away. Never had one reply back. Now, these boys are paying for their own courses, their own tickets, which run into thousands of pounds. And they're just not getting that money back. And wages are in like that. And it's nobody's willing to, the companies are not willing to pay for nothing anymore. They're putting it back on uh, the employee. I remember years ago, 
the, the government in this country used to tell you, never, ever pay out your own pocket to get a job. But that doesn't happen now. Because that part of it, part of it, uh, part of the guarantees of getting a job now is all tickets must be valid or in debt. But they just keep on invite, inventing these new tickets, the training yeah. providers. Screw, screw, screw the men. The guys are, the guys are paying it because if they don't pay it, somebody else will and they won't get the job. But I, don't, I just don't know. I just, we need somebody to grab the bull by the horns, Christian, and say, right, lads, we're, we're just running, running in circles here and we're getting nowhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, what do you think the answer is then, Dougie? What do you think? I think, see, people's circumstances are different. You have to nail the heat there. Uh, utility bills, inflation, rises, uh, mortgage rates and all that. Uh, you get in a stage where it's just not worth it anymore be going in Danish jobs. Is it worth, worth the sacrifice? You're putting strain on your relationship with your partner, strain on the relationship with your kids, if you've got them. And it's, it, it just seems it, there's no compassion left. Now, these people talk about safety. I don't want to keep Hagging on about them, right? And mental health and that. Seeing this boils down to it, there's not really many people and many companies actually care about the men's or the employees' mental health. See, as long as they turn up at work every day, they've got their bailer suit on for half seven in the morning and they're a hard tap and they're ready to go to work, they don't care. I mean, some companies' employees, coaches and that. But you never know what's going on in people's heads. I've been unfortunate enough in my career. I've seen guys jump off a offshore platforms. I've seen guys drop dead on jobs, heart attack. I've seen guys dying in their sleep and dig somewhere in a remote part of the country. And it's not nice. Nobody ever, ever seems to care. They all talk a good talk. You could put a post on that LinkedIn tomorrow about safety, or you could put on a post that you've just won a contract. Right? I dare any used to try it is put a post up, or even say, right, I've just... Uh, I've just been uh, promoted to construction manager or something, a chief welding inspector. You wait and see your yeah, congratulations you'll get. The industry, there's a lot of people in the industry, I think, me personally, don't have any mirrors in their house because they clearly aren't looking at them for a start. They're quite happy. Uh, to vindicate people and get rid of them. But these people are only standing up for the agreements that they're working in. They're only trying to maintain that standard. It is the companies, the employers, who attack these agreements for their own benefit. Yeah, I think the, the big problem as well is sort of a lot of men in the industry, we don't speak about mental health and we don't speak about how things are affecting us. And, and as you said, being away from home is difficult. It has effects on you and, and your partner. But we, there should be more help out there, really. You know, a lot of it is just put a poster up. This is These are your options. But it should be promoted more and we should be helped more. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, but I just don't see that happening until... We'll get our own shit together first. 
Now, anybody that walks on air, it used to be years ago, you had to be, I remember the shop stewards, no, no, this wasn't that long ago. You couldn't get on to a job in a Clyde, a Retain, a Rewea, a Tease. First thing you had to do was the, the first person you met when you went in that gate was a, a shop steward. They wanted to see your card and they checked your card. There's guys walking on to Blue Book jobs now. I've got no intention of being in the union. I'd rather be in the union again. And then that's their choice. But the days of the closed shop are gone. But these are the same people. A lot of times, not a lot of times, these are the same people that moan about the shite money, the shite wages. And then you've yep. got the guys who are in the union, but they never return a, a bit of paper on a pay deal. I went to London but eight years ago. I went down to London. I always remember it. Got up. I think I get a half past four train in the, morn uh, in the morning from Newcastle to London. Uh, arrived in London at half past seven in the morning. Went over to GMB. They asked me to go down and uh, count the votes uh, on industrial action. Uh, pay rise. I didn't even count a hundred votes. And to rub salt in a wind, the envelope she gave me was open with all the ballot papers and nothing was sealed. And my pal, he actually went to Aberdeen and he counted the Unite ones. But again, I think between us, you know, you've got the memory offshore industry, there's a lot of men employed there. I think between us, we didn't even have 500 votes. Unite, obviously, a lot more. Yeah. You know what I mean? See, that's why I always supported the RMT being part of wage negotiations. Because the RMT boys are always left on the outside looking in. And I think I'm on record as saying what is the greatest achievement you ever done? And I said getting ARMT on the negotiating table. That was me that stood up at the OCPA meeting and I said he's need to put your differences aside. I mean unions blocking another union guy from getting a vote in a ballot or a strike, uh, a pay ballot, or a strike ballot. How can that be right? Yes, it's not right at all, is it? No, I mean, they all shout about unity strength, but if you, if you, it's basically, it's like apartheid, isn't it? You know what I mean? Or you might be a union member, but you can't get a vote. Why is that? Because you're in the RMT. If you turned around and said, oh, you can't get a vote, why is that, mate? Oh, well, look at the colour of your skin. My national outcry. But they were happy to leave the RMT guys on the outside because of disputes in other areas. I said, oh, she's a den. It's hurting the people that are bothered and they are especially RMT guys, because at the end of the day, they used to shout unity strength, but we were never allowed to unify. That's why in my times, uh, I'm sure, I brought everybody in. I brought all the trades together. My, my last job was a Mariner project, which was a hookup a few years ago. I've never, I never ever... Uh, <laughs> I never got offshore again after the Mariner. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the employing companies must have lost my details. Uh, I never, I've never had a phone call and I let my tickets run out last year. Okay. Not because I didn't want to go back offshore, but I was never ever going to get a start. 
So do you think you were blacklisted then? I would say nine uh, nine point nine percent. I uh, okay. What happened was I'll, I'll tell you a wee story. How a mariner came about. Even on the mariner, I was on the uh, first rotation. So we all went to Aberdeen for a couple of days. Uh, met all the boys, few seminars, safety meetings and stuff. So, when we were doing the induction, Christian, I always remember us. And this uh, young woman came into the room and she was, her part was, she was running out this thing they called Lean, L E A N, as in thin. Yeah. And I, I picked up on it right away uh, and I went, he's a rat out here. So I never said much. Done my two days when I went down the road. Then I get put on standby for two weeks. So I carried on. Then I went out, done my first trip, blah, blah, blah. But what I noticed on that project, the project seemed to be top heavy with supervision, uh, construction supervision, pipe fitters, mechies, players, uh, welders and that. Well, they'd subbed the welding out uh, a company in the north, based in the uh, north of Scotland. And uh, so they supplied all the welders. So I noticed they were playing worker against worker. They were guys there and they gave him his fancy job title some of them were on well fit my player wages really uh, and a lot of them were paid 15 hours a day now the guys on the tools we were we were we were the plebeians we were the bottom feeders you know now, we were all PAYE guys. So, and again, we were on minimum standard rate. I think it was about £19.65 or something at the time, which is not a lot of money. Uh, 84 hours. You worked an 84 hour week for a flat rate, Christian. So, after a few trips, I went to him and I went, this job's going nowhere. There were all a lot of infighting. Men weren't they happy. Then the bullying started. I think it was stemming from it in Norwegians. Uh, they were trying to push guys into doing stuff. Uh, they were pushing guys into sharing PPE, which we're sitting back and going, you don't share PPE, mate. No, oh, that's just ridiculous. I said... It's personal protective equipment. Yeah. It's not fucking happening, right? Yeah. Right? Because he could have an eye infection. You're telling him he passes goggles to me or a, a skin problem. And I have to put on his glove because you can't get me enough, because you can't get enough disposables out here. No. So I went to him anyway, and I went, ah, fuck this. I said, I'm either going to wrap here or I'm going to do something about it. So I phoned uh, the GMB up and I said, look, I'm on this mariner. I said, it's a pits. It really was a pits. They were. So he said to me, you know what I'm going to ask? I said, aye, all right, uh, Dom Nebora. I said, when you're back? I said, a week Monday. He said, right, what are you going to do? I said, well, the first thing I'm going to do, I said, I'm going to call a meeting. I'm going to get myself voted in as a shop steward. So I did that. Went out. Any questions? The morning safety meeting. You used to have to have a safety meeting every morning, which is good because it kind of refreshes the guy's memory. There is a lot of good elements that, that come from what now, sure especially the safety side there, if it's done right. 
You know what I mean? There's a couple yeah. on there. So I stood up at a morning meeting and I said, right, boys, I said, the uh, management. So I said, right, I said, see this job? I said, this is probably the worst job I've ever been on. I'm sure, my life. I said, there's too many people here running about, inflating their ego and inflating their own uh, wage packet. I said, the nerd boys are on bottom dollar money. I said, after shift tonight, I said, I'm going over there and I'm going to book at cinema and I'm going to hold a meet and I'm calling a union meeting. And I want people who are union members that's in the GMB to vote me in. I'm going to ask you to vote me in, shop steward. I says, because we've had enough of us. I said, we deserve a slice of pie. So we've done that. Managed to get somebody from Unite. I had to bend his arm up his back, but I'm glad they done it. it, it the boys done a, a great job. We even got shop stewards back to back with ourselves. So I told them, I said, right, what is it we want? So we decided we were going for a bonus. We deserved something. So we asked them for three hours a day on tap paid at the end of the job and they wouldn't go for that. So they said they would uh, speak to the Norwegian uh, Stat Oil it was at the time. Uh, I've changed their name now. Uh, uh, well, it was Stat Oil at the time, as I said. So they said they would speak to him, but it's dragged on. So with a series of meetings, they pushed us. They never took us seriously to start. So we had a meeting, and the boys said, what do you want to do? I says, fuck them. I says, let's throw a chop in there. You know. I said, just to see what reaction we get. Anyway, stood up at the meeting in the morning. Anybody, any safety concerns? I And they were waiting on and you, because yeah. everybody's living in tap each other. You always get wee whispers of the gaffer's mate. He's not on the route, but he's got to go and he's, he's tilly tatting and that and uh, to make sure yeah. he's, he's got his own job right. You know, it's, it's just human nature. I just laugh about it, to be honest. So I, I basically called the men out. I said, I'm not going to work. I said, I'll fucking see you at dinner time. I said, the night shift won't be going to work tonight either. Midnight. And we'll see how it goes. So we had them wait. It was just a, a, a token, but they didn't like it. They didn't like the fact that we decided. And what they didn't like even more is people were taking pictures of hundreds of men <laughs> sitting about. Yeah. And the newspapers like the Sun, the Daily Mirror, and the Daily Record, they were taking the Facebook pictures. And they were using it in their cover stories. Fucking unofficial action. Yes. So we ended up, things did get a bit better. They tried this on, that on. We ended up, we got a bonus. It, it never suited everybody, but we were running out of time. And the guys like myself, who'd been on the job, we got eight and a half grand. It, it wasn't the ideal, but... If we hadn't had done it, we'd have got nothing. They were absolutely walking all over the top as Christian. And it just wasn't nice to see. So instead of blacking me, I've always maintained they should have been thanking me because I saved that project for them. They never saved it. Because they had all they had all these supervision. And then when we came to the payoff, so we got a deal done. And you know yourself, every job starts a down, man. Uh, this will probably haunt me the rest of my life. 
I seen everybody. You know how everybody gets a an assessment. We they started the uh, overriding the foreman assessments, taking words out, taking scores out. This is a uh, the managers, and they left some guys feeling as if they couldn't put a nut in a monkey's mouth. So we had to bring a phone in. And so I said, look, everybody get an appeal in. If you're not happy with your score, get an appeal in. I think my last trip, I done something like 85 score, <laughs> score appeals in a two-week Brand. trip. I'm sure that, that's what I done for a whole trip. And then uh, I went home on my leave and I was over in Spain for a football. And uh, I got a call that I'd been down, man. It was it was embarrassing. It really was. Uh, managed to save some boys who deserved to be saved, but could never save everybody. A lot of guys says, stuff them, let them score me what they want. I'm finished with us. And... I think that job finished a lot of offshore careers, you know. I really do. And it's sad to see, but because a lot of these boys were good boys, good, honest boys, you know. I mean, and that's the ones you feel for. And a lot of them have reinvented themselves now. Eh, they're all running about as engineer for this, engineer for that, but not got an academic qualification really to back it up. So, that's the way we're going. It's it's uh, it's becoming job for the boys now. And yeah, that is a big issue. It's about who you know or who you're friends with. You'll never stop nepotism. You'll never stop. It's impossible. Mm-hmm. But there used to be a time where the best apprentices every year I took in and they were groomed and they'd maybe make them up a chachan once the time came out. And then they progressed to foreman and maybe shop foreman, blah, 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 and what they'd be up into management. I don't see that happening anymore. Maybe it does happen in the smaller companies, the engineering companies, welding companies and that. But when you're a contractor at Disney, I always find the best people or the best foreman, or you know, the guys that uh, might be a foreman on this job, or they might be a superintendent on that job. You might not see him for a while, and then see a foreman down the line, you meet him, and he's back on the tools again. Always find that these people always keep a level heat. The communication skills are better. They don't, they wouldn't ask you, they don't demand things for you. To ask you, I think we need to we need to get back. I think a lot of time there's a lack of communication on jobs as well. Uh, there's a lot of people in high positions who have absolutely no communication skills whatsoever, uh, Christian. Uh, but. Where do we go? If people won't join the union, if people are not prepared to take action, stand up for themselves, where are we going? Well, Just... Obviously, it is happening in certain industries at the moment, isn't it? Like you said earlier, the nurses, uh, the railway industry. Yeah. But the, the RMT, to be fair to them, I met the late Bob Crow, but 12 years ago, doing it. We had, we'd organised a, a blue book. Remember when the uh, 2012 Olympics was on yep. in London, uh, which new West Ham Stadium? We'd uh, organised the, the Nike boys organised the demonstration doing it. Because that was actually supposed to be a Nike job, which was never really implemented. It was just all subdued. We companies all around about the Southeast. 
uh, I always remember that guy said to me, oh, what kind of money are you looking for? I said, well, I want national rates at the time. And they went, oh, no, I can get uh, platers and welders down here for £14 an hour. And of course they could, because they were bringing them in at the time uh, from all over the world, Eastern Europe, not just Eastern Europe, by the way, they were bringing them in from the Philippines and that. Yeah. They were sticking half a dozen of them in a two-bedroom flat and claiming uh, they were local labour. Uh, uh, how, how did they get away with that? It was just they, a national scandal. They and, did the same with the gas plants as well, didn't they? I remember there was a few strikes on uh, some in South Wales. We went to a few with the United. I was with United at the time. I think I might, I might have been at that one. <laughs> Maybe. It was the one in Port Albert I went to. Yeah, yeah. But you remember the one on... Uh, I'm not sure it was that gas plant. The one in Newport. What was the one they built in Newport about 12, 14 years ago? I'm not sure. I can't remember what it was. I know it was Newport way anyway. Well, this was before that. I all kicked off at, uh, we had a time of Gordon Brown's famous words. Uh, British jobs for British workers. We ended up uh, starting a website and all that, Fairfax. It was a communications website, but the government got it shut down for a while, a few times and that. So when Tony Blair signed us up, uh, a free movement of people, what they didn't tell you was, is not every country in Europe signed up there. I think there was only three, and it was Ireland, the UK, and Poland, I think. And what they done was, they, the unions knew about us years before, and then they kept them. I think the GEM being Unite were opening offices abroad, places like Poland, Germany, uh, Belgium and that. We're hearing stories, oh, they've got a branch out here. So what they were doing, they were, they were, the companies were recruiting workers. Now, I know you might find this hard to believe, but I actually voted Brexit. And the reason I voted Brexit was, is because I was part of the British jobs for British workers, where nearly every, on series of days, nearly every, night your job in Britain stop. Obviously, the power stations and that were up and running. You had to keep them running. But we came to an agreement anyway. So but nearly all the guys were out. I think one day with 7,000 guys estimated outside Lindsay Oil refinery. And they mapped up the road past P66 or was a escort and that and try to encourage others to come out the gate. Some did and some didn't. You, you know yourself. Anyway, what they were doing was, for us British jobs for British workers, was because they'd signed up with this agreement, they'd overstepped the mark. So they were saying there was a skill shortage. Uh, and what they'd done, they brought all these Italians over from Italy. Uh, and they stuck them in barges in Grimsby docks and they applied all these. No traceability, no nothing. You didn't know if a guy was a plater, he was a rigger, he was a pipe fitter, or what, what he was. But just all running about. It was like a wacky races. So then they started, British people were getting refused on these jobs and it spilled, it never just happened there, it happened at West Burton at the start as well uh, West Burton uh, and what's the one at York we had a protest there all, all the Welsh boys all, all come up with that one yeah. that was the day it all kicked off for the coppers can't remember the name of the station but we guys from York who sat on the shop stewards used to, regular shop stewards used to turn up at a, a night of shop stewards forum and that. 
who lived in Europe, surrounding areas. These guys couldn't get jobs on here. So when eventually a union came and rallied the troops, the unions had to be really, if I'm being honest, and I remember back correctly, a lot of union officials had to be dragged screaming against their will. Uh, they signed up with this agreement. It was basically a, an attack on a national agreement. They were bringing these guys in, anything from players, welders, riggers, laggers, you name it, they were bringing them in. And they were pumping them onto jobs. No traceability, and they were paying them 12, 13 quid an hour. So they were even, some of them were employed by organised gangs. And they were actually taking, the boy showed me his wage packet one day, they were actually taking £300 or £400 out his wages every week. So if they were doing that for him and they had 100 men on the job, they were making 40 grand a week off them boys. It was wrong. It was yeah. absolutely wrong. Uh, and, but the problem was, the unions never told the men the truth. They never told them that they'd opened these offices. They, they'd allowed this to happen. It's because they were affiliated at the time to Gordon Brown and the Labour government and Tony Blair before them. They had their own MPs. I mean, some of the MPs turned up at the demonstrations in a York. Uh, places like Atlantic Oil, mostly. Uh, we even went down to the Isle of Grain. One day we blocked the road. Remember a, a bus coming up to Liverpool? We travelled through the night. We were on a Blue Book job uh, in East Humber on the Humber Bank. And uh, we drove down during the night and we joined the thing, mate. And it was just full of Portuguese, uh, Spanish, uh, Eastern Europeans, Poles, Lithuanians, uh, Romanians, and that. It was next to no British guys apart from supervision on the job. So anybody that doesn't believe that companies will do anything they can, right, to make squeeze every penny is absolutely mistaken. They don't care. They just don't care. They want the jobs done for as low as they can. I mean... You're just a number to any company, aren't you, really? That's the issue. Well, I No, a guy phoned me about four weeks ago off LinkedIn. He's a CEO in a recruitment company. I'm not mentioning his name. Smashing guy. He gave, gave me half an hour of his time. So I had ideas about how we could change. Right? Now, I've never really ran them out full, but I've told a few full-time officials about it. But I've been as well talking to that dog lying there sleeping. Uh, because all you got out of them is we're doing this and we're doing that. I'm not doing nothing. These full-time officials are becoming the Merlin salesmen. They're recruiting guys. They've got to hit a target every month with so some of the unions, especially the GMB, I think. And they've got to hit a target. They're basically a sales people. How many new members have you got? They're then transferring that onto the shop stewards. If they can get a shop steward, Christian. Right? And they're transferring that on to men to recruit guys into union, which has never been a problem. But if you're doing that for him, to keep him in a job, but you're standing up with a pulpit, putting your head above, right, looking over into no man's land, you, you're the first one butchered off a job or bulleted off a job. 
Did you just disown you? There's never, ever been in there. And for me, and I've never, ever accepted this. When I used to attend uh, the National Shop Stewards Forum, they had, had them th three a year, I think it was. So the unions were doing deals uh, behind people's back. And what they were saying is, we'll get the right people onto the jobs. We want shop stewards. We want us. So they were drawing stuff up in the SPAs and that. And what they were allowed to do is they were drafting their own shop stewards in. So fair enough, that's fine. So if you worked in South Wales, We'll take him and him, right? Do you just want to do your steward on there? Aye, all right, no problem. But it became apparent uh, uh, you had to be one of there. You had to be in the click to get this. So I know guys active, some just live down there, some live in London, uh, who actually sit on the Executive Council. In fact, they're up for election for the Unite Executive Committee. These guys have never been asked to be shop stewards on a job. Some One of them was blacklisted, couldn't get a job for two and a half years. Thank God he's in employment now. But these guys were just hung out to dry. And that's what today. Now, to me, this is bad practice and you're sending out the wrong message to people. If you're trapping stool pigeons in, what kind of example are you setting to the rest of the workforce? Especially if you're putting a guy in as a convener who can't be voted out, who's been picked by the parent company or the employing company. So he's basically untouchable. You know what I mean? How is that going to get guys into a union? I just I just don't get it. I really don't. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think a lot of people feel let down by the unions. And, you know, certainly a lot of people I speak to would say, well, why should I pay if I'm not getting anything back? I suppose the only time you, you would really need a union is if something goes wrong. And then if you're not in the union, then, you know, you're not going to have any help, do you? To me, it's a double-edged sword. If you're in the union, that's fine. Right? All you've got is an insurance policy if you get an injury. Right? If you're organised the job, the guys will try and get last in first out, or as near out as they can. Be bit of protection. But if you start and open it up and then taking guys in uh, in national jobs, national construction jobs, or even offshore, well, offshore is a perfect example, when you're playing worker against worker, and you're paying a guy higher, which he probably does deserve a self-employed guy, higher than a guy on PAYE who's through books. That guy, you are waiving, basically waiving your employment rights or anything like that. You're just being used as casual. But sometimes it's these guys who are kept on and the guy who's PAYE is out the door if his face there, isn't he fit? So I just don't understand it. I mean, the whole idea of it was is you took your guys on PAYE, they paid the tax, they paid the insurance, you paid them their pension, their holiday money, and their travel, the thing. So, but if you were struggling for men, you brought in subcontract labour. But these subcontract labour were supposed to be first out the door. But if you make your whole workforce self-employed subcontract labour, it's just every man for themselves. It's madness. And I just, 
but for whatever reason, it must suit them better. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, obviously, a lot of companies do that now, sort of only take on the majority of men through the agency. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of agencies, I mean, I, I've spoke, I speak to agency people every week, some of them really nice people. But yeah. they're only at the day of job. You've got to understand that boys don't see the overheads these companies got, right? I'm not sticking up from here. They have their overheads in their offices and this. But I always use Aberdeen as a perfect example. You've got all these office blocks in there overlooking the river in Aberdeen, the river Don in Aberdeen. These companies are making millions are all these fancy new office blocks when they be sitting there. So they're making a lot of money. And it, they're making money hand over fist. I think it's time the boys organised themselves and said, look, this is what we want. This is what we want. We want this. We want that. And, and they need to stick together. I would gladly go out and rejoin the union tomorrow again. But it certainly won't be the GMB union. That's for sure. Um, I know a lot of people were looking forward to hearing your side of the story and, and what you wanted to say. Um... I, I, I do like a wee rabbit on if I'm being honest, uh, Christian. I mean, it is my passion. Uh, and I feel everybody if everybody gave something back into the industry, it would make it better for the young guys like yourself. Uh, I think, I really honestly think that we've lost our way, as I said. But I think it's like a blind leading the blind now. I think this summer could be making a breaking for a lot of people in the industry. We're having, there's a lot of guys been marginalised and pushed out of the industry, as we said on ageism, whatever. Uh, I think it's wrong. Thing is, we need the older generation to be, you know, helping and teaching. Sort of as you said, the younger guys coming through. Because I know I lot learned a lot from some of the old blokes in in the workshop where I worked. They'd spend a few hours with me, show me how, yeah, you know, how to weld this or how to weld that, and, and that was invaluable, really. That, you know what I mean, Christian. But we have to, we have to. I mean. Me personally, I mean, I've no what I'm coming up in six months, I don't know. Most of that being my choice. Uh, I decided that I was having the whole World Cup off, uh, so I packed my job in, uh, went on a shutdown after that. I didn't like it. The uh, facilities were dreadful, couldn't get nothing to eat. Uh, starving, digs were terrible, no decent digs about very expensive. I thought, oh, I'm not going to make any money here, so I got off. Sat down, watched the World Cup, then the football come back. I said, ah, I look for a job in a new year. But I have been offered uh, quite a few jobs, but just just very poor money. I mean, I was offered a job two weeks ago, £13.28 an hour. I, I was here in Newcastle which I politely declined. Uh, yeah, I can so, imagine. Uh, then the guy did, be fair to him, he did have another job, but I think it would have been about 120, 140 round trip a day, mile round trip a day. Uh, even at £15.80 an hour, I just said, no, I don't, I'm not going to work for it. And I'm certainly not... I certainly won't be going in a number of other companies either. I'm I'm not paying two national insurances, uh, Christian. That, that won't happen. And until someone's done about it, it's not going to go away. It's going to get worse. An umbrella. So for anybody listening now or watching, um, can you explain umbrella a little bit? Because obviously I know you pay national insurance twice. Um, what you do is right. So a company will offer you a rate. 
but it'll be a number really. Right? So say it's ten percent above PAYE, uh, Christian. So they might offer you a rate, say twenty two pound an hour, right? But that's an all in rate. It seems to be coming very popular in the MOD jobs. Uh, ship building side of things. I mean, some of the rates look absolutely great. Like you might, they might be over thirty pound an hour. But when you break it all down, you're not. So if you take your lodge money off that, right? So that's three hundred pound a week. So that's seven pound fifty an hour, run it. For yeah. a basic forty year week. Then you've got your travel. So you might be a travelling man. So your petrol might be a hundred pound a week. We take that off that. That's four hundred pounds. So that's you lost say ten pound an hour right away. So if you and you don't get holidays either. So what is that like twelve percent, twelve point five percent? Which is twelve and a half percent. So you take twelve and a half percent off your rate, right? There's no pension paid or anything like that. So in a lot of the time it will be a flat rate. So if you're working six or seven days, i.e. a weekend, and you're on a, a straight rate, or sometimes the overtime rate can be less than your basic rate. How is that even possible? It happens. I've seen it happen. I've actually worked under it, to be honest. And you go yeah. scratching your head and going, how is this? How is this? But that's what it is. But at the end of the day, it's all down to the individual. You can't slag a man for taking a job. If he's got a family, a young family, bills coming out his ears, he's got a, a car, a mortgage, you can't condemn. Some people need money coming in all the time. But what I try and do now is when I'm working, is try and put money a, a lot the majority of my wages are away every week. It's not possible for everybody. Uh, but even what in a way is getting to a stage now where it isn't worth it anywhere. I mean, I'm a, I was on a EFW plant in Aberdeen uh, most of last summer, for the spring, right up in the autumn, uh, until I left. And the person, the company I was working for, I can't afford them. Uh, the, the guy who owned the company actually put your dig money up, uh, £50 a day tax free, and gave us a 12.5% pay rise because inflation was hit some like 11%. Or somebody said, Look, this is not good enough. So it isn't always about uh, margins and profits for everybody. A lot of the time now, I think you're better off working for the smaller companies rather than the big companies because their overheads are massive. Now, a guy ran a poll yeah, a week and he was asked, a guy who's a CEO, the same guy I was talking about earlier, this guy has got vision. He, he's light years ahead of people. Uh, he goes out, he treats people like human beings. He wants to go out, and if a guy's doing a job for him, he keeps him in work. He wants to use the same guys. He doesn't sit in the office all day. He'll go out in the site. Now, he's only supplying labour, but he's going out and make sure his people are happy, and he wants to re retain them people. That's the kind of people we should be attracting into the industry, the people who care, not the ones that start out in the right way, and the kid on the care, like the HR departments, the HSE boys. I think I like the HSE boys shouldn't be able to be manipulated by companies. I think maybe times come where they should be directly employed for the HSE, where companies can't dictate that they don't want them on the job. The, 
the government decide where they go. Keep these guys employed all the time. If there's enough facilities for them to go, take, take them away where they can be threatened and bullied by the companies to act on their behalf instead of doing the job that they were actually employed to do. Because a lot of these guys are, are trying to do their job with one hand tied behind their back. Christian, it's wrong. It is absolutely stinking to the core. And he's actually putting his cell on the line here. If, if you were an HSE guy and you were being manipulated, and God forgive if something bad happened in that job, they're going to hang him out to dry. It's the same way as if you have an accident on a job or somebody gets hurt in a job. First thing they'll do is run and get the permit. Check this, they'll yeah. check up on the train. It's all diminished responsibility. It's taking the blame off of the yeah. company and then putting as much blame down the line and then it ends up uh, it ends up at the door and the guy who's been injured. Yeah. It, it's shocking. I mean, the first, if you were on a site tomorrow and say you fell down a hole and then broke your leg, see if all the a lot of a lot of jobs will stipulate. See if all if you, they need an ambulance to get you off that site, they'll want you to piss in the cup before you. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, 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 it's absolute. It's it's a lunatic's run the asylum, but we're putting up with this nonsense, and I just don't think anybody does. We all go for the one thing. You go to work, you want to laugh, do a bit of graph, make a few quid, look after your family. But it's not good going to work if there's no harmony in the job, if there's no part or nothing like that. You used to get characters in every job. You just don't see enough of them anymore, Christian, you know what I mean? All the fun is getting squeezed out the guys. And there's too many people that are happy. It, they, they'll give you a, they'll put guys into a stereotype, oh, I don't want him on here and I don't want him on there. That's because they know the guy knows his shit. He knows what he's talking about. He knows what the employment laws are. He knows a bit about safety. He knows a bit about all the things that they know. He knows as much as them. And a lot of a lot of companies and management see these guys as a threat. And for whatever reason, they'll try and exclude them off a job. It's terrible. Uh, did you ever hear about uh, probably a four year time? Uh, they used to have a thing in this country called the uh, Economic League, and it started in uh, the sixties. Maybe just a before little bit before my time. Oh, definitely. I. <laughs> well, I, was, I was actually born in sixty six, so it been yeah. going okay. for a lot of years. Yeah, uh, an Economic League were basically set up by a government. Uh, what they were doing is they were basically checking on people. It was a spying mission. Guys were getting mm -hmm. prosecuted uh, industrial action and all that. So when it got disbanded in 93 and that, there was a guy called Ian Kerr who had worked for the Economic League. So this guy had a mountain of information on a lot of people. Now, Kerr at his time, so he set up this agency and I think he had 45,000 names, addresses, contact numbers or whatever of people on his list. And companies were paying him a fee. A lot of building companies, engineering companies were paying this guy a fee. And 
when guys were filling in application forms or details, they were vetting them through the agency. And he did, even had his own wee code, code lettering and code words sent up. And he was sending them back. And guys, they were written up. Uh, they were written up. Uh, guys with CVs, basically. Guys when they get on jobs. So, and then the spy, Polis, the youth, the Polis, uh, cops were getting involved. You've you've seen the any demonstrations where they're filming people and stuff like that. The Polis were then passing information on to the companies as well, spy cops and that, and they were vetting people. It was sometimes in instances that were hacking guys' phone, no the mobile phones come out and that guys were getting the mobile phone hacked and stuff. Yeah. And uh, there was a case, I think Dave Smith from London, uh Dave was a guy that wrote the blacklisted book with help with somebody else. And Dave tells his story about some uh, a taxi gun. Dave's actually put out the day to put the government's admitted that the polis were involved in it uh, and they were using it to blacklist. Now, it wouldn't surprise me if companies are using LinkedIn today the same way. It, you've got to believe no evidence true. But how easy would it be to go into LinkedIn, kid on you advertising for a job, using somebody else, and blah, 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 bang. And then you get these people vetted. You're sending that away, and somebody's vetting them at Kerr. Kerr never went to uh, a trial when he got caught. He ended up, he got his offices raided. I think it was just him and his wife at work on it. And uh, before he was charged, like out in bail, Ian Kerr actually went into the woods near his house and hung himself from a tree. Uh, and he basically, I think his, his wife went and answered questions for him. Now, that guy made a lot of money, a lot of bad, did bad things. But he ended up paying threat with his life uh, when uh, he put a rope round his neck and decided he was going to end it all rather than go to court and face the humiliation for ruining or in people's lives. Absolute disgraceful. So I think guys have encountered a lot of the industries encountered encountered blacklisting. But there's never been a case. Well, it, it's a case of how do you prove it? That's always going to be a hard thing. How can you prove? I mean, I know people that were awarded sums of money from Ian, uh, from Ian Care. I think the highest pay I heard was ninety grand. But see, for that ninety grand, that guy was a pipe fitter. How much earnings did he miss out on in the 80s, the late 70s, early 80s, 90s, when all his mates were working up on the big sites, making seven, eight hundred, nine hundred pounds a week, and he was working at home in a wee fab shop or something, getting him about 200 quid a week or something, you know what I mean? So Yeah, it's all fun, isn't it? The compensation, the compensation will, will never, ever, uh, but we'll never compensate enough for what these guys went through. And I think you really need to be naive to think it doesn't happen and it, it won't happen to you. And that, that's why, I mean, I have guys coming on to me saying, he does a favour, will you put something up? I need bother. And I always insist I want the truth. If you don't tell me the truth and I find out the post comes down, no naming names uh, for Mende, right? But it goes back 
if you gave people an inch, they'll take a mile. We've all seen it on the sites where they've gave you an extra 10 minutes or something or they've gave you walking time. There'll always be, it's human nature for people to try and take that wee bit there. And yeah. it's no different when you're doing your shop steward. I mean, you could guys will come to you for advice and you'll give them advice. But a lot of the time, guys can't follow that advice too because they're scared in case they are blacklisted or they're vindicated for, for standing up. Yeah. But that's, that's doing to human that. That's, that's just the way we are. That's part of your DNA, isn't it? Me, I would always say, well, they used to say, if you fight, you'll probably lose. But if you don't fight, you've already lost. You know what I mean, Christian? And, and that's the way it should be. I mean, even though companies, companies are happy to keep telling you, not all companies, but some will keep telling you the same lies all the time. Like the government, they, they'll keep telling you the same lie until eventually people start believing it. And that's the way it is. Just a lot of it is uh, scaremongering. But at the end of the day, I think if wages don't improve, I just see more and more people dropping out of the industry. Or maybe not, maybe stop travelling. So hopefully the guys will get their act together. The unions will get their act together. I think Unite, this new woman, Sean Graham, it took over Unite. I think I think she's a good one. I think she's more proactive uh, with the boys. She sits and she listens and she pushes for stuff. We need more people like that. We need more union people. People in the offices in London or Glasgow, or Cardiff or whatever. We need these guys after us. And we need them more interaction with the men. We deserve a pay rise. Britain is a poor man of Europe. We work the longest hours and there's not a lot of benefits anywhere unless you're higher up the tree. Christian, but things that ain't going to change, they only going to come out and offer you a twenty percent pay rise, or a, even a ten percent, or even an inflation pay rise. You're going to have to get it off your ass. You're going to have to fight for it because if you don't, we might as well just put a light suit, mate, and get him go fishing or go a walk up the hill with a dog or something. No, I mean. Yeah. I, 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 that's where we're going. We ain't heading in any direction, as far as I can see. No, I can tell how passionate you are as well, and it's you know it's been great to speak to you and great to hear your views. Um, Fantastic! It was nice, nice to come on. Uh, the light in here is not very good, by the way. But uh, I, it was nice to come on, uh, yeah. and hopefully, people have covered. A lot of your agendas and a lot of it, it people can relate to. And even if it the only day at something simple, let like go out and say, I mean, when I get back into work, I'm, I'll be rejoining the, the union again. So I say, I'll probably join you tonight. Uh, but I put a lot into being a shop steward over the years, and it, it can be rewarding. Uh, it puts a lot of pressure on you. I, 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 when I was shop steward, a lot of the time, the men came more important to me than what my two kids were. Because I was dealing with the men every day. When I came home, I seen my two boys, whatever. They always done what they want. Anyway, you know what I mean? Uh, but when you represent the men, I always tried to get it 110%. Put the men first, put the men last, and make things easy. Because if the men are happy, the companies will get the job done. And they'll get it done safely. 
I mean, there's a lot of trade route to that. I mean, some of them, them, them scaffolders, I mean, the guys on the tube and the clip, I've never seen guy, anybody work like them guys in my life. That's I mean, that scaffolding, isn't it? Stop. Yeah. I mean, it, some of these boys is just nothing bothers them. They're just, and they just go, go, go all day. I mean, I always, I've shown that some of the jobs they do are absolute fantastic. And to think for years and years, these guys were on less money and players and welders and that was disgraceful. You know, thankfully now they're up, but we need better than what we're getting. And I'm just not convinced that we're going to get here. I'm just not convinced that there's the appetite. Uh, I think we're spending too much time on social media. Uh, uh, we're learning about getting our teeth done in Thailand or fucking Turkey or something. No, I mean, Turkey teeth. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of the guys these days that you see on the building sites, by God, some of them are better looking than a woman. No, I mean, that must just be up uh, Newcastle way, is it? Or... Oh, I as there is there is, there is, there is a lot of guys there. Uh, yeah, but you can spot them anyway. I mean, it's a good laugh, a good talking point. I mean, I'd probably go and get it myself uh, if I could afford that. I'm all right with a hair like. Uh, no, your hairline's fun. looking good, yeah. Yeah, hair's not falling out yet, but uh, no, nah, teeth are a bit fucked, like. But uh, okay, again, then. Yeah, well, if we can work it out how to do a live, maybe next time we'll do a live one and people yeah, can join but, uh, and maybe ask some questions. I think, uh, hopefully, you get a lot of views on us. They probably won't all watch it at one time, but people will watch it. Uh, we yeah. need something like this in the industry. Just, but at the end of the day, you've got to look after yourself. You know what I mean? Just yeah. keep asking the questions. That, look, if I can help... At least, even if I was just only to help one person, then at least well, it's better than doing nothing. Yeah, but, but well, it's a fantastic attitude. That even I always try and share jobs. They maybe not suit me, but they maybe yeah. try and suit somebody else. And no employers, some of the recruiting companies, the rates are dictated to them. So they need to make money as well. And you've got to understand that. I always had this vision. I, I was always a people watcher. See, I could watch people. Uh, and you could see what they were like. You can get to tell who was a team player and who was all about the individual. I, I, I used to watch and... I thought, oh, I've got my eye on him. No, I mean, I'm watching that. Watch what you're saying to him. I don't trust him. No, I mean, but there's good and bad in everybody. You know what I mean, uh, Christian? So if you can help somebody get a job, it might mean it, you're making it easier for yourself. Maybe someday will say, well, I've got no option. I'm not to phone us. Do get help or not and see if he wants a job. See if I can get me come down here for five weeks or blah blah blah. But the answer will always be the same if you're if you're not paying the rate. Yeah. You know what I mean? No digs, no do. Simple as that. You know what I mean? It's just too expensive now. I mean, I used to be lucky enough when you were starting a job on a blue book, even a repair job doing South Coast somewhere on a boat or something like that. I used to try and keep a bag of sand for going, cover your travel, your petrol money, your digs and your food and that. No, until you get a pay. A bag of sand wouldn't even hit the side now, Christian. Uh, price of digs, because sometimes you just can't kind of get digs and then you need to go to a higher step. And before you know it, you might be paying £60, £70 a night. And they might yeah. want a week up front, or they might want two weeks up front. And then you've paid a lot of money. But you might pay a thousand quid out in digs before you've even been on the job. It's 
Yeah. When it away I saw maybe we, we should come to a way where the companies will maybe start paying the dig money after the first week instead of leaving it as lying on, help the guys, you know. Yeah. Uh, but so, so you get in a stage now where the dig money isn't a fit for purpose as long we wages, but that's up to the men. Not many men they mandate the unions to get in and get a better deal. And that'll only happen when we get our act together and we start unifying and becoming strong again. Because at the moment, we're as weak as it, it's cups of tea, man, the works canteen. We are. We're, we're, yeah, we're just no, that's true. But let him, him rabbit say the mine's stuck in the headlights. I've got two rabbits there on a, a bow window, you know. Well, there were Christmas presents for the grand bears, but because it's cold and that, so they'll go outside in March and come back in in about October, November again, you know. Okay. What's the names? I've not got names. So, uh, one, one of them's, uh, you're going to laugh here. Hmm. Uh, my missus, uh, she loves Lincoln Park. So my name's okay. called Chester Bunnington. Okay. You know how much hung is there? The other yeah. one's called Luna. Well, she's called Luna. But that was her name. She, he's actually her son. And I've got a friend here, which I adopted. Okay. Here. Say hello. Here. Are you knocking on? Uh, oh, yeah. there we are. Adopted. Uh, I don't, me and the missus adopted her uh, three years okay. ago. She's getting on a wee bit now, but she's all right, Christian, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah she, oh, yeah. that's great. Right. It gives you something today because no, no fucker will give you a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, anyway, soon enough, something comes up and, oh, and you get, well, get yourself well, back in the work. Look, things always well, work out in the end. Yeah, because uh, my oldest boy's getting married at the end of May, so... Okay. Uh, maybe money does not last forever, Christian. You know no, what I mean? Definitely doesn't. But yeah, thank you very much for your time, Dougie. And yeah. hopefully I'll speak to you soon. Yeah, uh, top top guy. All right, mate. Yeah, thank you, yeah. mate.